Talk. The News Round on Off The Ball. With Gillette, for an effortless finish to your day. New Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. Welcome along to Thursday evening's Off The Ball. It's Will with you this evening because Nathan is off watching the first round of the PGA Championship where Rory McIlroy is ripping it up. Later in the show, though, we're going to be taking a look back at what's been a fantastic... It was a pretty much a 45-minute spell for Irish boxing earlier. A huge success in Turkey at the World Championships. Double gold for Ireland in the women's finals. Uh, Lisa O'Rourke following in the footsteps of her sister, really emerging as a world-class talent during these World Championships two years out from the Paris Olympics. And Amy Broadhurst as well, collecting a gold medal earlier today. We're going to be talking to Annie Mitten about Manchester United, looking at some of the best ever finishes to a Premier League season. John Giles also looking forward to the last weekend of the Premier League and some crucial matches tonight in the race to beat the drop. And we will be looking at Brian Cody and the dominance that Kilkenny have had since he took over Kilkenny in the winter of 1998. Delighted to say we've got angry producer Mick McCarthy with us. Hey, Mick. To give you your official legal title. <laughs> An old school title, yeah. Yeah, it's like Ronan Mullen when he's the senator. And we've also got Carl Milani with us as well. Carl, how are you getting on? Hey, lads, how's it going? Um, Carl, I'm going to start with you because I'll be totally openly honest that earlier on, when Amy Broadhurst was in the ring, we were recording a piece for later on in the show. Hate to break the fourth wall, Mick, sorry here. Yeah. Well, we thought I've been streamed live on the internet. Yeah, so people know so, so, we, yeah. we weren't here. So uh, didn't get to see all of Broadhurst. Got to see just the end of it. Um, she won unanimously though mm. and did get to see O'Rourke who again was very very impressive won on a 4-1 split but I think won comfortably in both the first round and the third round so tell us first about how good Amy Broadhurst was brilliant uh, so dominant there was no real doubt I think the first round was slightly tighter and then once the second round was over I think it was a formality from there in terms of, of getting through and getting the gold medal and it's remarkable to think just in half an hour and 45 minutes just how the history of Irish boxing has changed today in that Kelly Harrington and Katie Taylor were obviously the previous two winners at the Women's World Boxing Championships and now we've got two more in the yeah. space of 45 minutes which is hard to believe and in fairness to Katie Taylor I mean she isn't involved in this boxing championships but her legacy has already started which is remarkable to think because she's still at the top of her game in terms of the professional uh, fighting that she's doing at the moment and possibly and we'll hear about that in a minute uh, about the possible Crow Park fight that's uh, coming up hopefully down the line but it's amazing that her legacy is already reaping reward with two new world champions now and you think when when the years go on and there's uh, more youngsters looking at uh, Lisa O'Rourke and Amy Broadhurst today and the success that they've had the impact that that will have down the line as well so it's onwards and upwards I think but yeah what a what a brilliant afternoon Yeah, Gavin Casey's going to be with us just after 8 o'clock to break down today and the future path for these boxers as we get ready for the next Olympics The thing that stood out for me though Mick because we were all kind of sitting around laptops and mobile phones out in the office a little bit earlier on uh, watching these fights is that I remember when Joe Ward boxed in a world final John John Evan uh, Conlon when he won his gold mm. we're all on terrestrial TV it was a little bit weird watching this on YouTube when it comes to you know world finals even if it's not let's say at the end of an Olympic cycle and it's right in the mid- right in the middle of it currently yeah it's disappointing isn't it I was just I was just watching them back as well and it's great that you can go onto YouTube and watch the fights back but it's like no offence to the guys doing it but it's a kind of a, a very analytical sort of soulless commentator who like at the end of the fight doesn't even um, doesn't even kind of like react to the fact that the fight's over that anybody's won or give any sort of uh breakdown of the emotion there's no announcement when they're winning there's just no soundtrack to this amazing you couldn't even hear the announcement no on you the second fight because he was off mic for the actual coverage yeah and the fact that there's no soundtrack to this achievement and but like it's secondary to the point that most people aren't going to go and find this on youtube we're just still not at a point where this is whereas if this was broadcast on tv and look to be honest there's a lot of things that aren't on tv and that rt don't cover that they probably should but this isn't an easy one either. You know, like, I mean, this is an amazing achievement of sport, but it's it's also not something that's happening in a... It wouldn't be the easiest thing to cover, I suppose, is is the way I'm putting it. You know, it's happening in, you know, cavernous arenas where there's not huge crowds and there's not a great production, not great production values and so on. Like, there's a lot wrong with boxing 
an amateur boxing that we can't necessarily pin on RTE either. But at the same time... Flip side, the argument is, though, these, especially with the way it worked out, and Spanish TV, because I was looking at uh, Joe O'Neill, who was out at the moment, uh, a yeah. you know, prominent boxing tweeter, yeah. who was basically saying that he got screwed over because YouTube blocked it in Spain because Spanish TV decided to show it. And he was thinking, yeah. their last-minute decision has screwed me over, while Ireland didn't make the last-minute decision. Yeah. So RTE could have went, taken the world feed today. You've got two Irish women in boxing finals within half an hour, 40 minutes of each other yeah. it would have made for an easy package go on air around half past four give it a bit of build up and then you're off air by six o'clock yeah and it's like it's a proper golden hour for Irish sport there's not many times that we're going to win two world championship gold medals in worldwide sports like this in an hour and you know the other sorry I was obviously playing a little bit devil's advocate there mm -hmm. and kind of like make excuses but I actually think it didn't need to be a last minute decision boxing is a sport where we compete on a world level in the way that we do in pretty much no other sport we're going to talk about Roy McIlroy in a few minutes you know and that might be it you know rugby okay there you go right That that's I'm, I'm probably forgetting a few there's probably already texts coming in the texts in. and the comments on the stream are now going to be they've never got past the quarter final in rugby Man, right, boxing fine, is a fine, fine. We're, all, we're obviously we're obviously competing in rugby yeah. okay that's, that's I, I don't need to go into a culture war about rugby tonight right mm -hmm. this is about boxing but it, it didn't take a genius to say right you know what this is something that could be special this week let's go and put something into it and make a big thing about it as well because it's not just a being on TV for eyes to find it. It's about a promotional campaign that makes it bigger by you, by RT. Let's, let's, it's not just RT. Look, it's us, it's everybody else as well. I'm just saying, like, this is huge. Come follow us. Come, come join us for this journey. And, look, I mean, I don't know if we expected two gold medals, but I think, I think we'll talk to Gav later. I don't think this is massively unexpected. No, I think it's probably uh, a slight overperformance. I yeah. think the fact that Kelly Harrington wasn't going probably yeah. brought the expectation down a little bit because of just how successful Kelly has been, and given that she would have been going into this as the reigning Olympic champion and, you know, previous world champion. But still... There was a lot of hope, particularly on Broadhurst. This is not an overnight story here with her. She's been plugging away for a while. And yeah. we'll talk about her and Kelly Harrington previously at Lightweight coming up against each other. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be really good at uh, getting female boxers at 60 kg. It's something we've been turning around very well. <laughs> uh, but boxing is Ireland's most successful Olympic sport. And that probably raises the question why maybe we're not giving it a bit more profile. Because the other thing is, Mick, for these two women now, mm -hmm. this is huge. They go to the top grade of funding from the Sports Council. Yeah. Um, effectively, if you are hoping to go to an Olympics in 2020, for, it eases all the pressure of funding for this next Olympic cycle. They're going to be reasonably well paid over the next two years. Yeah, which is brilliant. Like, you know what I mean? That Talk about just like a, a load off as they kind of get ready for the Olympics now and try and, try and get there. Look, the other thing I was thinking of is completely off topic of what we're saying. That's right? what the news runs okay. all about. Four Irish Olympic gold medalists in women's boxing. One of them has played for the Republic of Ireland. And as cap for that, and Lisa O'Rourke, seen pictures going around of her celebrating. Ross Common, mm. winning their, uh, the, I think, Division Three in the football it was like high achieving in other sports too for at least two of them. And that's with, without me digging into other sports for uh, Kelly Harrington or Amy Broadhurst. Yeah, look, they're transferable skills. Uh, before Kelly Harrington's final last year on our Olympics coverage, we were chatting to. Ronnie Walsh too who's very good friends with Kelly Harrington she was with us uh, on OTB last summer and again she played with Shamrock Rovers in the League of yeah. Ireland right up until the point when she decided to focus on boxing so those transferable skills are very much there and I suppose like if you're a good athlete in a sport Mick chances are you're probably going to be well primed to be good at something else yeah well there you go Let's. I still think we actually over uh, like I not, don't don't want to bring every conversation back to Kay Taylor, but I think um, sometimes we do forget that the fact that she actually was an international footballer while she was like winning world championships in boxing and being the best women's amateur boxer of all time. Hopefully now to go on to be the best women's professional boxer of all time. But yeah, you know she was just playing for Ireland. Like the listeners will probably remind me on five three one zero six because they'll remember better than me. But I think it was the Denmark goal which won the goal of the year. It was like a oh, banger a of a shot from outside yeah, the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which just goes to show how good Katie Taylor was at yeah. a young age. Um, the news round, of course, we are chatting about golf as well. Uh, PGA Championship call. Here we are now, first day. So many majors in recent times. Rory McIlroy has gone up in smoke on day one. That is not the case this time. It's not, but he's just made another bogey, ah, unfortunately. So uh, sorry to blow your introduction there. <laughs> but he's dropped back to four under par now, Rory McIlroy, in the closing stages of his uh, first round. He's been really good today. Um, we've watched a good bit of this in the office uh, during the day, and he looks really dialed in. Um, very good with, with his wedges, a couple of really nice wedge shots, but he's just made two bogeys on the sixth and the eighth, so he, he started on the tenth. So he's currently playing his last hole, which is the ninth, and he's four under par now. So he's still at the head of the field, but his uh, lead was three 
uh, a little while ago, but now he's been joined at the top by Tom Hoagie and uh, Will Zalatoris at the PGA Championship. But all things considered, it's still a good start if you can par the last or maybe catch another birdie back because we all know his trajectory in majors in recent years has been to start poorly and then finish strongly and still get his top five or top ten as he did at the Masters. Um, it's sometimes a bit deceptive, Carl, when this happens, that Rory McIlroy looks out of contention by the end of Thursday or Friday, then has a solid weekend and usually a very good final day. And then you look back over his record and there's so many top tens at majors for him in recent years. And yet if you look back at the tournament, you would say, Rory McIlroy never actually contended at this match. Yeah, yeah. So for him, the key is to try and be in the mix heading into the weekend, into Saturday, and then in the final couple of groups on Sunday. Um, but he does look really, really sharp. And I have to say, Tiger Woods looked really sharp, I thought, at the outset as well. But he is tired uh, considerably. Uh, he's three over par now, playing the last as well. Um, and Porrick Harrington has struggled on the first day. And Shane Lowry and Seamus Power just teeing off around now. But the golf course there, require, the greens are tricky. Uh, McIlroy looks to have put it pretty well today, uh, by and large. And his... His game has been quite good this year and his stats are quite good, which would suggest that he should be in contention. Um, the the rough can be tricky at times at Southern Hills and it's quite a long golf course as well for a par 70. Um, but all things considered, I think he'd be quite happy with his efforts on the opening day. If he can get down the last and avoid disaster on the last, he's certainly going to be in the mix. We had Greg Shackelford on the show last night and he was talking about how good Tiger looked and it's kind of it, it sort of tells you what he said basically predicted what happened today. Mm. Started off brilliant, hit some lovely shots, but by the end of his practice round yesterday, wasn't able to walk. Yeah. You're like, why is he playing? I know it's great, and it's great for talking points and everything like that, but if he can't get around on the, on the Wednesday, how is he going to be doing it on the Sunday? It's like, it's, it's obviously too early for him. And he obviously tired as the, as the round went on today. It's kind of, I, I, I feel like there's a bit of a pressure on Tiger's comeback, be it coming from him or from the world. I think, it might, point, I think it might you know. be internal. Like, yeah. St. Andrews is there, in the yeah, middle of the summer exactly. and that's yeah, when he started. but he didn't commit to the PGA and said, right, I'll be there at St. Andrews. I would have loved him just yeah. focus. Literally take a break, yeah. get back to the point this summer. Because what, what we very quickly forget, Carl, is how bad Tiger's injuries actually were. Absolutely. And the just to get back to where he is now is a remarkable achievement, yeah. uh, both physically and mentally, uh, all of that. But you mentioned St. Andrews and Joe made that point last night as well. That's definitely in his mind. I mean, that would be the comeback of all comebacks if he could try him for the home golf in, in, uh, yeah. in the summertime. So I think that's what he's looking forward to, irrespective of how he does this week. Like, he performed quite well at the Masters. His first round was good. He, he did uh, fade off a little bit, possibly something similar this week, if he can make the cut. But I think it's just a case of getting uh, game-time minutes, if you like, under his belt ahead of the summertime. Yeah, look, I'll never entirely write Tiger off after what happened at the Masters a couple of years ago. Never would have imagined yeah. that that could ever happen again. But Tiger's game is there. Maybe St Andrews is a little bit more forgiving because you're not walking around the type of hills that he's having to treat with this week and the same with the Augusta National. Uh, the news round, of course, is brought to you by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. And where are we going next, Carl? Well, let's, uh, should we start with uh, recapping the boxing history for Ireland this afternoon because Ireland has two new world boxing champions. Amy Broadhurst and Lisa O'Rourke have both won gold at the World Championships in Istanbul. Broadhurst beat Algeria's Aman Khalif by unanimous decision to take gold in the light welterweight final and O'Rourke won the light middleweight final following a 4-1 victory over Alina Pangwan of Mozambique. They follow in the footsteps of Ireland's previous world champions Katie Taylor and Kelly Harrington. In other boxing news today, initial engagement has taken place with a view to staging Katie Taylor's next world title fight in Ireland, according to the Minister of State for Sport. There are calls to stage the rematch with Amanda Serrano at Crow Park and Minister Jack Chambers told the hard shoulder here on News Talk he'd love to see the fight at GAA headquarters. So just say we, we've had some initial engagement and uh, I fully uh, would fully support and would love to see Katie Taylor fight uh, in Crow Park. I think it would be a national event and would bring uh, you know, one of our brilliant ambassadors in sport to Ireland who's uh, been inspirational for so many years. Doc Chambers there speaking on the hard shoulder here on News Talk earlier today. Mick, it feels like there's momentum towards this happening uh, on two fronts. Eddie Hearn and Katie Taylor have been pretty outspoken about the fact they want her to fight in Ireland. Yeah. There's a realisation that she's coming towards the end of her career. There probably won't be too many other opportunities for this. A fight against Amanda Serrano, given how good the fight was in Madison Square Garden, would fill Crow Park. I think Irish people are event junkies who would buy a ticket on a one-off, even mm. if they weren't massive boxing fans. And then the issue of putting MTK fighters onto the card may well disappear if they're under different management. So the stars might just align time-wise on this one. Yeah, and also the police being, once again, kind of happy to have boxing in the country. And obviously, you know, I, I, 
I think it would sell out too. However, I do think I don't think it's straightforward. I think first of all, I think that Katie brings a kind of a a, a family kind of audience to fights that like, you know, this is going to have to suit an American audience as well. What time are we talking about for uh, ring walks yeah. in yeah. Crow Park here? Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a few things that we have to kind of iron out here, I think. Yeah. But look, I mean, let's hope it happens. Like, you know, I also think initial engagement sounds like a great, like, you know, uh, Friday evening GEA show uh, to bring back to <laughs> replace coined that just ball. in case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, look, I genuinely think it would. Uh, I think it would require, though, people who complain about Katie Taylor not getting a huge amount of coverage actually buying a ticket to go. Yeah. They're no, the people who would need to buy a ticket to go. 100%, yeah. And I, I look, I do think there's an, a, there's an event junkie aspect to it. I think that the promotion for it, I feel like what the crowd will be will be a storyline in itself, which I think will ha- necessarily help the crowds. You know, we've seen that in the past for yeah. like, let's try and break a record. Let's, you know, and people do get behind that yeah. reasonable price might help as well Absolutely. and I actually do think like, yeah. you know if you try and fill something like Crow Park for a boxing fight it actually you know it's a lot cheaper than going to an All-Ireland final normally. What do you reckon Cole? Yeah well I think the thing about Kelly Taylor is I think she transcends her sport and that she appeals to people that have no interest in boxing now yeah. and she is I think there's a genuine appreciation now amongst the sporting public and the wider public in Ireland that we're witnessing one of the all-time greats in world boxing now and now is the time to go and see her on home turf if it does happen Yeah. so that's why people might be tempted to go uh, that maybe aren't necessarily involved in terms of life experience and being able to say that you saw Katie Taylor live the could be one off too yeah oh yeah the other thing though is that it's not a um, it's like it's it's Serrano again so yeah. it appeals to both sides like yeah. the boxing people want to go to this fight as well it's not Al Blue Lewis mm. you know fighting Ali mm you know, just for for a payday or whatever. This is like, and, and just for the sake of fighting in Crow Park, this is like the fight that deserves to be in there, you know? Mm. Uh, I noticed as well the uh, Burton family uh, from Eden Derry who brought the ring in for the Ali fight because it was yeah. in the handball alley they moved it from into Crow Park itself. They've offered to, to put the ring in this time around yeah. as well. It's the so same ring. Buying. I don't think it's going to be the same ring. Um, <laughs> I think if the ring from, was it, 1971 is still around, it's probably not best suited for a, a world-class boxing fight. But the other thing as well, Carl, uh, Amanda Serrano versus Katie Taylor, in and of itself, take all the emotion out of it, take all of that out. That fight was so good, I think most people want to buy a ticket and go and see it. Definitely. As Mick says, I mean, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's not a swan song by any stretch of the imagination. It's a genuinely huge fight. Uh, obviously, the, the fight in New York was unbelievable. One of the best ever fights that many of the journalists who know a lot more about boxing than me would say is up there with one of the all-time great battles. And the prospect of that here on home turf in front of such a large crowd would in my mind, definitely go down in one of the, the top sporting occasions that's ever been in the country. And yeah. we, we've held some big sporting occasions before and we will in the future, but that holds water with any of them, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you just got to make sure it doesn't rain. That's the other difficulty about <laughs> well, trying yeah. to find the time to actually have the fight on. Uh, but look, if we can have Ed Sheeran on a two-week residency, we can definitely have a stadium fight. Uh, Johnny Giles, the great Johnny Giles, is going to be with us at around half past seven. But football tonight is pretty crucial, Carl. Um, two of the teams who are in the relegation scrap are looking for points tonight. Yeah, that's right. And Everton have the chance to secure their Premier League status and their manager, Frank Lampard, is hoping that the home supporters can help their efforts this evening the Toffees entertain Crystal Palace knowing that a win will secure their top flight status for next season they face Arsenal away on the last day but Lampard hopes they can do the job at Goodison Park this evening you know that's a good thing and you know if you'd have offered that to us a few weeks ago for, for sure we probably would have taken it um, but that's how it's, it's just words at the moment it's nice that it's in our hands if we can put in the right performance uh, get some things that go our way tap into the to the atmosphere which is going to be special and night our fans are going to turn up in huge numbers to support the players um, if we can tap into that, then we know we have a, an opportunity to, to get where we want to be. And kick-off for that game tonight is at 7.45 and we can cross over to Goodison Park now and get the team news with Shane Pennington. Everton boss Frank Lampard makes one change from the side that lost 3-2 here to Brentford on Sunday. Michael Keane comes in to start. He replaces the suspended Jared Branthwaite. Whilst for Crystal Palace, Patrick Vieira makes three changes from the side that drew one all with Aston Villa on Sunday. Jordan Ayew, Will Hughes and Geoffrey Schlupp all come in to start. They replace Luka Milivojevic, Czech Kiate and Conor Gallagher. At Goodison Park, it's Everton and Crystal Palace.
And as I say, kick-off for that game is at 7.45. Seamus Coleman in the Everton team this evening. Two matches underway from eight. Burnley will move out of the relegation zone and swap places with Leeds above them if they take a point at Aston Villa. And Chelsea will wrap up third spot if they overcome Leicester City. One game here at home tonight as well in the SSE Electricity League Premier Division. Shamrock Rovers have the chance to open up a seven-point lead at the top. They take on bottom side UCD at Belfield and kick-off there is at 7.45. Mm, it really moved in uh, the defending champion Shamrock Rovers' favour in recent weeks. That win against Derry Atala uh, a couple of weeks ago as part of that it was on Jack Byrne just over two weeks ago and Jack Byrne was like yeah we had a very poor first four games of the season it's been a real race with Derry as Carl mentions that game being brought forward by 24 hours means they could be sitting in a very comfortable position if they were to win against the students tonight Do you know the thing about the Derry game Jack Byrne very quiet at least until it went 1-0 Graham Burke very quiet you know like it's, it's Rovers is such a rounded team now that's what made me kind of think oh god if you're looking for what if you can bring Danny Mandreo off the bench and that's it actually yeah, you know, squad and depth like, yeah it's a squad depth yeah, yeah. Uh, um, difficult for UCD as well apparently the reason this was moved back 24 hours because some of their players have got exams which are starting tomorrow so not exactly ideal to be playing at the Belfield Bowl uh, just before you've got a uh, big exam to do um, Dublin and the Champions Cup then call it seems to happen in years of three so the Champions Cup final was here 2003 2013 2023 that's right, Dublin's Aviva Stadium will host next season's Heineken Champions Cup and Challenge Cup Finals. The 2023 competition deciders will be staged on Friday the 19th and Saturday the 20th of May. It'll be the fifth time Dublin has been the host city for a European decider. Next year's showpiece was originally slated for the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, but changes to the football calendar has resulted in tournament organisers selecting the Lansdowne Road venue as the designated ground. Sloppy seconds for the Aviva. They won't care, Josh. <laughs> I remember the last one, though, was unfortunate. Everyone was hoping it was going to be an Irish final in 2013. It ended up being too long against Claremont yeah, and Byrne. I was there. Yeah. Didn't I, really... I, as, I, I was only talking about this in the show a couple of weeks ago. I can't even remember why, but, like, it was one of those ones where there was, like, a great storyline in that game with Claremont trying to get over the line against Big Bad Toulon and Johnny Wilkinson's last hurrah. And there was loads in it. And it just, I remember just being bored. I remember just like, you know, have it staying at the bar, being one of the people Jerry Thornley is giving out about at rugby matches, oh. you know, uh, which I wouldn't normally be. And I don't, it's, it's unfair, but it's just, we don't want an all French final. And we had one as well in 2003, I think it was, yeah. Toulouse and Biarritz, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I think I said to you in the crappy quiz uh, the week before, uh, even two years before that, when the Aviva had the then UEFA Cup final. Yeah. Porto and Braga. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, left yeah, early. Yeah. And I was one of those people who, again, was going out to the hospitality uh, yeah. during the middle of the game. It, well, well, that was a really poor one, though. Yeah. I actually remember thinking that was a pretty good game, but I, I, look, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's easy to say from, from uh, watching it. What slipped my mind was Leinster yeah. played in the Challenge Cup final at the RDS in 2013. Yeah. Totally forgot that. That was... That was remembered today, 2013. It's 10 years ago, which is hard to believe as well. It's not mentioned as fondly as the four stars that they have. Yeah. It's kind of one of those ones that snuck under the radar slightly. Yeah. Went out of the Champions Cup early, went, oh, won the Challenge Cup, yeah. Um, elsewhere, Camogie taking an idea out of the women's AFL and the AFL. They're going to have a Pride round. Yeah, that's right. The Camogie Association has announced plans for a Pride round as part of this year's All-Ireland Championships. The third round will be called Pride, Pride Round and it will celebrate members of the LGBTQ plus community through a variety of initiatives. And as you mentioned, the AFLW in Australia also has a Pride round during the course of its competitions. Also confirmed as well, pre-season for the AFLW is going to start in little under a month's time. So I think those players who are currently in Australia, many of them have stayed out off the back of the season just gone by, won't be around for the Senior Ladies Football Championship this year. The draws were made for uh, those earlier today as well. We've got the Ulster team news for this weekend, Colin. Yeah, that's right. Scrum half John Cooney returns to the Ulster team as one of three changes for Friday's crucial URC match at home to the Sharks. Cooney replaces Nathan Dogue, while Tom O'Toole comes in at prop in place of Gareth Milasinovic. Uh, Alan O'Connor starts in the second row of head of Kieran Treadwell with the replaced trio all on the bench. Ulster are in fifth place in the table going into the final weekend, just a point behind third place Sharks. Both teams know that victory in Belfast fast tomorrow will guarantee them a home quarter final in the inaugural competition. Time to chase through a few more stories before we finish. Qatar is going to have female officials at the World Cup. That's right. Female referees will officiate at a men's World Cup for the first time at this year's tournament in Qatar. Six women officials in total will be involved when the competition gets underway in November. British referees Michael Oliver and Anthony Taylor are among the men who will be taking charge of matches. Meanwhile, a man who headbutted Sheffield United's Billy Sharp during the pitch invasion that followed Nottingham Forest playoff semi-final win on Tuesday has been jailed for five and a half months. 13-year-old Robert Biggs from Derbyshire played a guilty to assault occasioning actually bodily harm. The Forest season ticket holder has also been banned for life from the Championship Club. Hibernian have appointed Lee Johnson 
as their new manager. The former Sunderland boss has signed a four-year deal at Easter Road. Of course, Roy Keane was linked with that position earlier on in the discussions about that particular job. There's some live Gaelic Games action happening uh, tonight as well. That's in the Munster Minor Football Championship semi-final. Cork leading Tipperary by two nine to five points. That game is approaching half-time at Semple Stadium. And just to briefly circle back to the golf because Rory McIlroy has finished with a birdie. So he's five under par Rory. after his opening round. So he is currently one shot clear of the field. Will Zalatoris and Tom Hoagie in second on four under par. As for some of the other latest scores of note, Shane Larry has parred the first. He's level par after one. Shane has parred bogey the first, so he's one over after one. Tiger Woods has finished four over and Porrick Harrington is now seven over par. Uh, playing the last hole so that's the state of play at Southern Hills Yeah, I edited this week's Golf Weekly which you can pick up on patreon.com forward slash golf weekly and the guys are going to be providing content uh, between now and Sunday because they're going to ramp it up for a major week basically there's an hour and 40 minutes of the podcast to preview it it's nearly all Jordan Speed. I'll save you most of it if you want to scrub through. The guys are all saying Jordan Speed is going to win. Jordan Speed is going to win. You know who barely got a mention? Rory McIlroy. And look at how Rory McIlroy has started. I kind of like the way, and I like the name here, Beardy Dave on the text on 53106. Evening, lads. Could they not just let Tiger go around in a golf cart between each shot? Or would that be frowned upon? Or would the organisers be worried that he might turn into Johnny Knoxville and the boys and go jackass on all the greens? <laughs> I was going to talk. We ran out of time last night. I was talking with Dan and Joe. And I was honestly, I was was about to ask it's not it's not that it would frown upon it's not allowed mm. but why is it not allowed is it is it to just maintain the idea that sport is uh, that golf is an athletic sport and you can't have someone going around in a car in between their shots because honestly tiger could play at least 50 odd 55 50, could play them much longer jack yeah. will probably be playing if he could take a car to go mm, ah, yeah <laughs> eventually i'm sure you have to you, have to you lose some muscle mass yeah. in your in your swing and whatever but like you know, th the reason Tiger isn't able to compete at the moment is because he can't walk around for six days as he has to do almost with practice rounds and everything yeah. like that, you know. Imagine just know. the bizarre experience to be for his playing partner, though. His playing partner is walking around with his caddy and Tiger is just... Well, you'd have to give everyone around. the choice. Ooh. Yeah. So you're saying lazy golfers could then just go, I'm going to put the feet up and use the golf yeah. cart. I don't know if it'd be great for the course. It might be the only thing. It probably would. I think, I think, I think carts generally go where the crowds are. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to be straight down the middle of the fairway. Yeah, yeah. Don't like think it would be a great idea. And like golf carts going around your local club is slightly different to golf carts going around a major venue. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> oh well, I so like very well kept local clubs in Ireland, though. I like the way you're thinking, uh, Beardy Dave, and also a text coming in from John as well. Jimmy McGee would have made sure that the boxing was on TV, and it, sometimes you need a good advocate in the media in order to get on. I think of uh, the results from every horse racing event going on uh, when you know back in the days when there were those who used to push for it within RTE too. All right, that is the news round. Thanks to Carl. Thanks to Mick.